This is our last uh, uh, teaching session, and then our next session will be more of a, you know, a time uh, for small uh, group discussion so that we could share with each other and also share personal stories and learnings and all of that. So, uh, just to quickly review, we today we have been just reminding ourselves of our threefold role as prophet, priest, and king. We're going to talk about that. So as prophets, we listen and speak. As prophets, we listen, speak, speak into your... Uh, so we talked about you know, how you do that. You hear from God, you speak for God, and you reveal God into your world. As priests, we observe and pray. And uh, so we teach the truth, we inter intercede before God also, we reconcile people to God. And just we're trying to, you know, just talk about how you can, you and I can do that in our immediate context, which is, you know, if you're a husband or a father, how you do this with your family. And definitely, you know, you extend this into all other aspects or spheres of life. So now we go to the last session, which is uh, the last role that we're talking about is that of king. So this is on page six, the second, uh, the lower part of page six in your notes. Um, so as a king, we reign with God, we represent the kingdom, and we also execute God's will on the earth. So as kings, we have to rule with God. So it's quite amazing. The Bible calls us as kings. Right? He has made us kings and priests unto God. It is, on one hand, it's very honorable, but it also puts a lot of responsibility. I mean, as king, you know, it's, it means there are things that are actually placed in our hands, your hands, my hands. You're king, you're in charge. Yeah. So we're kings. So we have to reign. There's that element of exercising authority and dominion as a king. Yeah, so God has given that to us, but he also intends for us to do that, exercise it. And so we can't be passive. And I can't sit down and not do something. Hey, you are a king. That means you are in charge. And God has vested that kind of authority and dominion. In your life and mine. Kings reign with God. We represent the kingdom. The kingdom of God you know, has to be released through us. Extended to us. Whatever God wants. His rule, his reign. It has to come through us. He says, I made you a king. He is the king. And we are kings under the king. Right? So through us. That kingdom is represented. And then we have to execute. Execute. So the king is responsible. Like he can't just say, I'll sit and give you ideas. No, you have to make sure you ha it happens. You know, it's your kingdom. You have to execute it. It's, it's all in your control. It's, I mean, it's been placed there. So you reign with God. You represent the, the, the purposes of the kingdom. You represent all the kingdom is. And you also enforce it. Execute it. You have the authority. You've invested with that authority to do that. So how do we practice it in our lives? And of course, you know, we're spending a lot of time talking about the immediate family and personal life and so on. But if you want to talk, how, how do you practice it? You can put it down in these words. Uh, you lead or you govern those entrusted to you. Start with your own life. You lead as a king. You provide and protect those entrusted to you. So there's that provision part. You serve those entrusted. You also sacrifice for those entrusted to you. Right? So um, when we say about king, we're not talking about uh, misusing. You know, it's like, oh, I sit down and everybody has to serve me kind of. No, that's not what we're talking about. Right? So we, we, we broke it down into purposely, broke it down into some very, uh, into words that are actually very simple. To you lead or you govern those entrusted to you. You provide uh, you protect, you serve, you sacrifice. Right? So in, these, in this way, we can actually carry out that 
role of being a king where you're ruling with God, you're representing the kingdom, and you're carrying out, you're executing what God wants for you and for those entrusted to you. So let's just bring it down to you know, personal uh, application, right? So personal life. So you are king. Think about this. You are king over your own life. You are king over your own life. Now Proverbs says, and I put, didn't put down that verse, but he who has no control over his spirit is like a city without a walls. He who has no control over his own spirit is like a city without, meaning, of course, it's in that biblical context. So a city without walls means the enemy can come in from any side and destroy. So a man who has no rule over his own spirit, I mean, he doesn't, he's not king over his own life. He's not able to manage his own life, a person. So it's, it's, it's so vulnerable, it's so open for anything the enemy wants to do. So first, as a king, you think about your own life. Being king over your own life. Lead yourself. Lead yourself. Right? So practically, okay, you're king. You start with, we start with our own self. You start with your own self. Lead. You know. So learn to be self-governing. Lead your own life. So be self-governing. I mean, I'm not saying selfishly. No, self-governing means God gives you and me the ability to govern our own lives. That's I'm saying, when I say self-governing, we're talking about really God is empowering you to govern your own life. You're being king over your own life. You're having control over your own self. Right? So look at that. And in what ways are you self-governing? Now, sometimes... You know, we run into people who lose control over their lives. Now, once one young man came, he brought, I think, I don't know how many, he brought a bag of mobile phones. I was shocked. He said, Pastor, I want you to keep it. Uh, in my mind, I thought he went and stole these from somebody. <laughs> He's giving it to me. Then he started explaining his problem. Now, this, is, this happened. I'm not joking. Before the lockdown, you see, he said, Pastor, uh, I have a problem with cell phone, I mean, with my phones. And I don't know how he managed to get it, but his problem is he's, he's, he's addicted to pornography on his phones. And now he has so many phones. Addicted. So I don't know what to do. So th if he had one phone, at least I say, you keep that one phone away. <laughs> So when he had told me, I said, okay, you keep that phone away. Now he's gone home. He brought his back, but he came with so many phones. Not one, I don't know, four or five phones. He said, Bruce, you keep it. Uh, he had lost control. Now, you know, it, it is, on one hand, it sounds funny, but actually it's very sad. It affected this young man so much. He, his studies was messed up. He's a Christian, I mean, from a Christian family, he's been to the church and all that. It's just the whole study is gone. What is the problem? There's no, no control on the usage of uh, these phones, and it's just thrown into it. You know, now, uh, we can only hold these phones for so long because you can always get some. I don't know where he got all these phones from, but you can always get another one and just get drawn into it. So. But the point is this, you know, uh, there are many people, and I'm talking about people in the church, because this boy was a church boy. He's been in the church, okay? Who lose control of their lives. For him, this was addiction to pornography, uh, and it was so devastating in his life. Uh, but there could be other things where we lose control. But God has anointed you and me to be king. It means he's given us the empowering to have control and start with ourselves. Be king in your own life. Be self-governing in your own life. So you watch over your own life. You keep an eye. If something is getting out of control, bring it back into control. You know, there could be anything. 
that goes out of control. So we, even I have to watch over my life. If something's going out of control, I'm doing, if something is just, you know, taking control of my life, I need to bring it back in control. I got what the Apostle Paul said. He said, you know, uh, this is 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 12. He also repeats it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I think it's verse 26. He repeats it twice. He says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not profitable. And I will not be brought under the power of any. So he says, there are a lot of things that are lawful. Meaning it's like, it's not illegal. It's not illegal. It's lawful. But it's not beneficial to me. So I will not be brought under its power. I will not be brought under its power. You know, so we can, I mean, if we go around now and ask people, what are the things that are like, that fall in this category? We can come up with so many things. You know, for example, how we use social media. You know, uh, yeah, and it's fun. It, it serves this little purpose. But if it is consuming our time, hey, it may be okay, but now it's not being beneficial. It has some benefits. You, know, you can connect with people. You can, you know, uh, or it has some benefits. But then it has a lot of things that you can actually take control of somebody's life. Their moods are affected by likes, dislikes. They wake up and see a few thumbs down, gone, whole day. <laughs> why not? Why they didn't give me thumbs up? <laughs> so what, what's happening? Something that is, you know, it really shouldn't be controlling, but it's so controlling our lives. And I was just listening to a, a recent study. You know, wh what they found out was only 7% of the people, of, of the whole, uh, of these internet users, a whole population, only 7% are the people who actually do all the, you know, um, the trolls and all do all the terrible things that affect people. So you, you get all kinds of, you know, news in your, in your feed and uh, it's only 7% of the actual internet, I mean, uh, social media users who are involved in the, all these very, um, caustic kinds of comments are. The majority are moderates. I mean, they just mind their own business. But what happens? The majority are being affected by the seven percent people who are putting caustic comments on the internet, doing all this stuff. But it's affecting everybody. Because moderates are keeping quiet, but they see all this thing coming up in their feed. And uh, it's affecting everyone. But it's a very small percentage who are doing that and they're damaging here. So why should we let our lives be controlled by some things like this? Yeah. So be king over your own life. If there is something pulling you down, then don't let it master you. Right? You walk always in submission to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, provide for your own life. See, there's nothing wrong in taking care of yourself. The better you are personally, the better you can lead others. So as king, so you're also protecting yourself, you're providing, so take care of yourself. So look at it like this. If you do well, you can take care of other people. See, so sometimes we feel guilty, you know, you're, if you spend time taking care of yourself. Why am I spending time on me? I should be spending time on others. Well, look at it like this. If you take care of yourself, you'll be in a better position to take care of others. So there's nothing wrong taking care of you. You know, if you need to take a break, take a break. You need to rest, rest. You need to, whatever you needed to take care of yourself. Don't feel guilty about it. A king, you know, generally speaking, he doesn't feel bad about enjoying whatever he is here. So enjoy. Of course, you know, you're doing the right thing in moderation. You know, you know, thing. But don't feel guilty about providing for yourself, taking care of yourself, right? And serve others. I mean, so I just put it down here like this. Now, be a king in your heart and a servant in your head. So you have a big heart, small head. Small head means, <laughs> you understand, no, when we say somebody becomes big in it, right? 
So in that way, you have a big heart, but keep your head on the ground. You know, <laughs> like attitude. You're talking about attitude. Be humble. Just be serve. Just serve. Right? So in serving people, just look at that. Look at that. Big heart. Right uh, estimation of yourself. Keep keep your head, and then sacrifice. Okay. It's so amazing. When Jesus came, he conquered not by force, but through sacrifice. So amazing. He conquered his enemy, his greatest enemy, Satan. Not through force, but through his sacrifice. So we follow the same example. You know, when you sacrifice, you're, you're being positioned or you're positioning yourself to conquer. Right? So the same way, think about you being a king, and, and let me try to club some of these things together. You know, think about a, being a king for your wife, your children, and of course, if you're, you know, uh, for your home, uh, and uh, we can apply this to your work life as well. But so, lead. You know, so women. And I, I'm not saying women are less than men. No, we are heirs together. Yeah, so we, we understand that. We, we don't look at ourselves as superior. We are heirs together. We are co-equal. But yet, God in his wisdom has said, Husbands, you be the head for your wives. Now God has said it. And that headship means you are providing leaders. And, you know, we're talking about leadership in church on Sundays, but, but think about a, a leader. If a leader has no vision, if the blind lead the blind, everybody ends up in there. So think about this. Basically, you know, the point is this. If a leader does not have a vision, we will and put in the context of the family, the home, the wife. What will happen to that family? Now you are the leader. God said it. You're co-equal. That's true. But He made you the leader of the family. If the leader is blind, meaning has no vision, so we're not talking about being physically blind. We're just talking about somebody no vision. You're not seeing anything in the future. If the head of the house is not having a vision what will happen to the house are you understanding right so you are king that means you're a leader and a leader needs to have so you need to pray God for my family for me and my family what, what, what must be the vision Now, family life happens. Every morning you get up, coffee is made, chapati is served. <laughs> Those things happen. Those are normal routine things. But you are the head and this family has a purpose on this earth. Your family, your house has a purpose. And you are the head, you are the leader. You have a vision. What are we leading the family into. Start praying into it. First thing, just start, start praying. You know, the prophet, priest. So you get God's vision. You start praying into that. God, as for me and my house, I know we will serve the Lord, but in what way? What kind of things? How do you want our family to be positioned to serve the Lord? That vision you provide for your family as the head. You know? Share it with your wife. And, and, and wives have been designed to follow the husband. God designed it there. So don't worry about it. Don't have to demand it. God designed it already. You're the head. Wife is, is there. She will follow. But the problem happens when <clears throat> the husband is not leading. Then the, That's when the wife feels like, oh, I have to take charge. I have to do something. At least one eye will come. <laughs> something. You know. 
So that's when there's, you know, all these things. But if you provide the vision, the wife will follow. You'll be, you're being the head for your family. Right? Provide, which is to nourish. Well, Ephesians 5, 22 to 33, this outlines what we're supposed to do as husbands for our wives. We're supposed to nourish, be nurturing. So, don't be afraid to find out the things that interest your wife, your spouse, and encourage those things. Don't be afraid to do that. Somehow, by default, we think the wife must only do all the things that interest the husband. That's the traditional thing. Huh? So, husband is walking, wife follows. But no. The Bible says we are to nourish. The husband is to nourish. That means you're nurturing. You're bringing out the good things. So you, 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 you look. You know, for those of us who are married, and of course speaking to you, you know, what are the things that your wife is interested in? And nurture those things. Nurture her, wife, her in those things. That's part of you being the head. This is in that same passage, Ephesians 5, 22, 33. You're the head. What should you do? Nurture. Encourage. Whatever. Thanks. You nurture that. So you nourish. You're nurturing. Your, that, that you're providing. You're cherish, serving through cherishing. Or you're being affectionate. Now don't be afraid to be affectionate. You know, if you look husbands and wives before they get married every uh, before they get married every moment they're holding hands engaged after marriage slowly <laughs> it goes off <laughs> five years into marriage her husband is there wife is there doesn't have to be like that and we can be affectionate even you know you grow older be affectionate Hold hands, hug. It's, it's, you know, becomes foreign after some time. Because the Bible says you, n you nourish and cherish. Cherish means to be affectionate. It means to really express that. So be affectionate. Express that. It's your way of serving it, nourishing and cherishing. Continue to be affectionate towards your spouse, your wife, right? And sacrifice. Be sacrificial. So the same thing we work through, think think through, think through for your own children. For those of you who have children. Lead your children. So how can you apply this? Think ahead and plan for the future based on what they choose to pursue. So as prophet, so you try to put these together. As prophet, you're discovering what God has put in your children. As priest, you're praying into those things. As king, you need to lead them into those things. Because they are children, they don't know. You have so much more knowledge and experience so you can guide them into it. So prophet, priest, king, to your children. So you think about it. See, sometimes, or at least traditionally, you know, when I was growing up, it's like parents left all the responsibility about career and future, they left it to the school. I'm sending you to school, work is over. But things are different now. The challenges and the opportunities are so numerous. In, you know, back in those days, you either ended up in science or commerce. Or arts. Choose one. We had three choices. 
Science, commerce, arts. Choose one. And if you chose science, okay, you can go into engineering or medicine. Very simple. These days, things are so different. You know, there's just so many career opportunities. It's, 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 it's great. But it also means the school cannot help your child figure this out. School can't. Schools can't do it. It's too much. So you, as the head, your head for your children too. So you get involved in that. Now it's going to take some time and effort from us to find out, you know, what are the opportunities. Well, you know, of course, as prophet, you you're able to discover what's in the children. As priest, you're praying for them. Now, as as a leader, as a king, you find out. You're governing. You're leading. You find out. You know, what are the opportunities that are best suited for my child, or you know, and then guide them into it. Champion them into what is good for them. So think ahead. Plan for the future based on what they choose. And uh, provide for them. Plan and prepare practically for their future. You know, plan for their future. Practically. You know, so those of you who are young or maybe you're, you're not even married now is a good time to begin some investments. Of what investments you make, it's your choice. But start now. So I'm not even married. Great. You can save a lot of money. <laughs> so invest that money. How you want to invest is your choice. You do it. Because you're thinking, I'm going to get married. I'm going to have children. I have to send them to school. I have to, you know... Take care of the education. I mean, this, all that is expensive. So, start investing. So, pastor, show to me in the Bible. God said, don't store up treasures for here on earth. <laughs> you are telling us exactly opposite. No, you know, that's a, big, that's a separate subject. Just, we can deal with it. But, but the Bible says, you know, a good man leaves an inheritance for his Children's children. Proverbs 13, verse 22. Huh? Not just children. <laughs> children's, a good man. Leaves an inheritance for his children's. You want to be a good man? <laughs> but think about it. This is what the Bible is saying, right? How, how can he possibly do it? Because he's planning. He's investing. He is, he's, he's thinking very strategically about his finances. So, start doing that. Okay. So, from the time you're young, you start working. Invest something. So how you want to do it? Do you want to real estate? Do you want to invest in uh, you know, mutual funds or whatever? So many opportunities are there. That's your choice. What you choose, invest. Why? You are planning for your children. So that when it's time for school, time for college, you have the means to do it. You with me? Okay, this is not financial planning class. <laughs> I'm just saying, part of being a leader is to um, think ahead to plan and practically for your children and serve your children. Now see, we can't be, this is again contrary to our own thinking. My children are supposed to serve me. Why? I should serve them. No. You're a king. You're following Christ the king. He came to serve, not to be served. So think about serving your children. You know, one thing, when Josh and Ruth were going up, Growing up, I wanted them to be interested in things I was interested, like read your Bible, pray. <laughs> I wanted them to be interested in what I was interested. 
So I started, you know, I was working through all this, trying to find out, okay, how do I get them interested in what I'm interested? And then a simple thought came. When you get interested in what they are interested in, then they will get interested in what you are interested in. Simple. Oh. If I get interested in what they are interested in, then they will get interested in what I am interested in. So I began to invest. And what, what's in, what, I try to answer, okay, what's he interested? Let me show I'm interested in those things. And we go. So, you know, if it means he likes to play football, go play football with him. You know, if he likes uh, cars or whatever, talk about cars. You know, get interested. If your daughter, she likes crafts or doing those kinds of things, okay, get interested. Then what will happen? When you're interested, when you speak of things that interest you, ah, they'll reciprocate. They will start, they will pay attention to that. Because you've already demonstrated interest. Otherwise, it's a one-way thing. And it won't last. But in order to do that, we have to serve. You know, in different stages of, uh, of as they're growing up, get interested. What interests you? And then, to the best you can, engage with that. So then when you speak of what matters to you, they listen. So what matters to them should matter to you. Then what matters to you will matter to them. But that's serving as a king in your home. Okay? And sacrifice. I look at time and energy engaging with the children. And like we said just towards the end of the previous session, see, when you are spending time with your family and children, don't think God is unhappy. God is very happy. Just tell yourself, God is very happy. When I just spend time with my family, because you're doing something very important in the eyes of God. Okay? So if you're spending time with your children, God is very happy with that. You know, you're being a father. Or with your wife, you're being a husband. So to be king in the house is you lead or you govern, you provide or provide or protect, you serve and you also sacrifice. And you've probably heard me share some of these things um, so, one of the biggest challenges, like we said earlier, is time. Right? How can I find time to be so involved in the things that matter to my wife or matter to my children? How can I find that time? Well, I know we're all busy, but what, what I would suggest is, one is, on a daily basis, Take short amounts of time. So even if it's 15 minutes, 30 minutes, on a daily basis, to talk to your wife. I mean, so it doesn't have to be come, let's sit and formal. No, just casual. You may be having a cup of tea, sitting, having dinner, but you're having conversation on a daily basis. And similarly for your children. Short amounts of time, maybe half an hour. Know, just check on their studies or whatever. You just short amounts of time. Then, on the weekends is when you spend, you block out larger amounts of time, Saturday, Sunday. Because during the week, we are all busy. You have to go to work, you have to come back, all that. So during the week, short amounts of time. Have a conversation. If it happens every day or regularly, they are very happy. They know you're involved. Then on the weekends, you put in your schedule amounts of time. So 
while Josh and Ruth were going up, for me, I blocked out Saturday mornings, most Saturday mornings, unless we had like a, a school of ministry or something. Saturday mornings till lunch was blocked for them. And at one point, for a period of three years or something, we had a certain routine. We'd leave. Uh, I would take them to music class. Then, oh, so, sorry, early morning, I'd go play, play football with Joshua. Then take them to music class. Then we'd go to sanctuary that uh, Mrs. Indrani had that. We'd have special omelette on it. <laughs> It'd be a, like sanctuary breakfast, uh, brunch kind of thing. And then come home. So it was like, okay, we know. And it was time just with dad. Sit down, talk. And now, if somebody called, Pastor, Benny Hinn is coming. Can you come and meet him? Sorry, I have an important appointment. I don't care who comes. There were times, people call, can you come and preach? We have a conference. Sorry, I cannot come. If it is in that block of time, I will not accept anything. It's been blocked for children. They are more important than the president. Block. Are you, are you understanding? So you, you, because this is important. God has put you king first in your house. Family. Now after that, you know, afternoons they'll get do what they want. Then you're free. You do what you have to do. But that time you've blocked once a week for them. So like this, you know, you work it out how you want your schedule to be. Keep short times during the week. Keep little extended time on the weekends where you can invest for your wife, for your children, uh, to provide this, to, to lead, provide, serve, sacrifice. A few more things now. Concerning the home, this is the bottom of page 7. So you're king in your home. You're going to lead. It's important to provide leadership for the family as a whole. And I want to encourage you to think about this, about providing leadership for your family. We talked about the wife. We talked about your, we talked about your personal life, the wife, the children. But as a home, provide leadership. Have a plan. Think about the future. See, many of us are very good at doing this in the workplace. An example, uh, if, you're, if, you're, I don't know, if you're leading a team, you plan. Okay, the team is going to work on this project. You get it done. You have a schedule. You do have this. All this. We are very good in that. But we don't do the same thing for the home. Home, where are you going? We don't know. <laughs> We are going somewhere. Aren't you planning for your family? Aren't you going somewhere? No. You're not thinking. So, have a plan for your family. For your home. Now, example. Suppose you are somebody who wants your family to migrate to go overseas. I'm, just, I'm not saying you have to. Example. Right? What must you do? You have to plan for it. And you have to work towards it. But you are providing leadership. You're being a king. You're providing leadership for that. You cannot sit at home and say, yeah, one, you tell your wife, one day we'll go to Canada. Or one day we'll go somewhere. I'm not saying, I'm just giving an example, right? But if that's the plan uh, to go to Canada, then you work for it. Have a plan. Uh, you, know, you plan it out. Okay, this is how we're going to do it. And uh, you plan out your children's education. Okay, if we are going to move in two years from now, our children will be in this level of education. We can do this, etc., etc. Whatever you're planning for your family. The point is this. As king, you have to lead your family, your home. And for that, have a plan. Or example, you want to buy a home for your family, have a plan. We already spoke about investing. 
for your family, for your children. Have a plan. But you are the leader. You are the head. Think about leading your home. Providing. Plan. Have fun times. Plan family vacations. Create lasting memories. Sometimes I, I run into people. And they say, you know, we've, our family has not taken a vacation last five years. Many times these are pastors. They feel very proud. I feel like, what nonsense. <laughs> I mean, what, you think you're all angels or what? <laughs> See, we are normal family. We are normal people. We are serving God. But we are, we are normal people. And families need, or people need a break. They need to, you know, rejuvenate themselves, uh, refresh themselves. But then they just go years and years, no family vacation, no going somewhere. Why? Life has been very busy. Most common excuse. But I want to as a leader for your family, you plan the vacation. What I used to do was the b before the year ends, for the next year, I would block out two vacation times in, in the coming year. So even before the year starts, we know when our family is going to go on vacation. One week, Towards you know, when the summer break, another week towards that October break when kids have that. So during that time, I don't have to accept any other invitation. It's been blocked. And then the family can go. So as a leader, see like I, I know I'm kind of speaking, some, you know, sometimes I feel ridiculous talking all this from the pulpit, <laughs> but I just feel... I need to say these things. Yeah. Because sometimes husbands don't think about these things. Or fathers. Think. See, think about it. You're the head of the home. You can plan this for your family. At least twice a year. One week, sometime, another week, another time. As a family, go somewhere. It does, you know, whatever you can afford. Now, whatever is you, you find interesting for the family. Because by doing this, you are creating lasting memories. See, one day we will all leave this world. What will be left behind? For most of us, it's the memories we have created. People will carry that. Same thing with the children. The memories you have created. The fun times. And so when you as a leader, you're planning for your home, you're planning these fun times, your children will always remember, hey, we had fun times. Create lasting memories. They will treasure that. They will look back and remember those things. Bottom of page 7. For your home, get involved in the Ministry of Home Affairs. Okay. <laughs> Let the business of the home become your business. I want to encourage you today, go shock your wife. <laughs> go and make something for dinner, or tomorrow morning you make something for breakfast. Shock them. What happened? <laughs> then they'll say, have men's conference <laughs> every, <laughs> every month. <you> know. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, the thing is this, you know, and I, I guess maybe some of it is cultural that we as men, you know, growing up in our culture, we kind of leave all the kitchen work, household work, you know, for, that's the ladies' department. Jen's department, okay, we go win money, uh, we go do the stuff outside, money comes. But 
it doesn't have to be like that. It doesn't have to be. I want to encourage all of us. Get involved in the home. Whatever you can. Maybe go just clean the dishes. Or cook something. Make something. Yeah. Simple thing. Tea. Coffee. Maybe till now your wife was bringing. One day you shock her. And you make it. <laughs> bring it to her. Whatever. Yeah. Just reverse the things. Get involved in the affairs of the home. Or if you like to cook, cook something. What's wrong? Nothing wrong. You're a leader, you're king, but you are serving. You lead through serving. And this is one way you can serve in the house. Or clean the house. Uh, you know, helping clean. I mean, of course, we do have people coming to clean the house and all that, but whatever way you can do, clean or fold the clothes or whatever, whatever you can do. It's not a feminine thing. No. You do it. But you are serving and then you're, you're, as a leader, you know, your family is going to uh, really appreciate that and what I put down here was, you know, what your children see in you is what they will do in their home in the future. And if, you're, if the children see you doing this, it's, it's most likely in their home, they will do it. And the kind of homes or families or marriages in the future are ma homes and families where both husband and wife carry equal responsibility. So even culturally, things have changed. You know, traditionally, it was a bit different, but things aren't, have changed in urban contexts. So it's good for us to model these things for our children because that's what they will do in their homes, in their families. To get involved, do those things in the home. So as, uh, as, le as, as king, the point is, you lead, you provide, you serve, you sacrifice. For those you're responsible for. So part of reigning is you are actually providing leadership. You're reigning with God. You're providing leadership for your home, your family. You're saying, God, I want to know your will and I want to see that established for my family. Now, that's all, all that we've said is on the practical side. But now, spiritual side, also, you have to exercise your authority. Spiritual side. Where we talked about prophet, priest, you're prayerfully watching. But then you also have to take authority over what the enemy tries to do against the home. So we shouldn't be naive and think that just because I'm a, 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 we are a believing family, the devil will leave us alone. No. We're a believing family. Jesus loves you. You love the Lord. But the enemy is also going to try to come and cause problems. So that is where as a king... You're going to take spiritual authority over your home to guard against the schemes of the enemy. So you are standing as a soldier or as a warrior defending what God has placed under your oversight as king. This is under your, you know, I don't want to use the word kingdom, but this is under your oversight. You are going to protect your wife and your children and whatever God has entrusted to you by exercising your spiritual authority. So you speak over your family. Or if you see the enemy trying to do anything against your family, any disturbance, you take spiritual authority over that. You know, these disturbances sometimes can come 
through other, it could be friendly fire, meaning other relatives. <laughs> Somebody else is causing problems, but it's affecting your family. And yes, you know, there is a natural side to it, but don't neglect the fact that there could be spiritual interference coming through these things. So you have to take authority. Protect your family. Use your spiritual authority. Speak the words of God over your family. Use the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God for your family. When you send your children to school, uh, you don't know who is the one who are teaching them. You don't know what influences them. But through your spiritual authority, you cover them, you protect them. You know, you say, I declare that the Holy Spirit is upon them. The Spirit of God is a spirit of wisdom, of understanding, of knowledge. He's a spirit of counsel. He's a spirit of might. He's a spirit of the fear of the Lord. That is what rests upon them. And I cancel out all ungodly influences that come to affect their mind. So what are you doing? You're exercising spiritual authority over your children. Because how does the enemy infiltrate or get into the minds of people? It is through the thoughts. It is what, you know, what they are hearing and all the things that are being put in their minds. But you have the authority to guard and protect them spiritually. You, you can't go and you know, silence the other voice because people are talking, whether it's teachers, instructors, friends. Those voices are there. But through your authority, you can protect the minds of your children from being affected by those voices. Those voices will always be there. I mean, we can't go and tell everybody to keep quiet. They're going to talk. But you are king. You have authority over the influences that come. So you speak. The spirit of truth fills the minds of my children with truth. The spirit of the Lord fills them with the counsel of the Lord. The spirit of the Lord fills them with the wisdom that comes from God. They can be hearing all other things, but the Holy Spirit is upon them. So you are exercising spiritual authority over your children. You're being king over what God has entrusted to you. Amen? So, we'll close with this. Prophet, priest, and king. Okay? So, I just felt to pass this on to all of us. I have to think about how you can use it in your life. I've tried to explain a few examples and things that I've done in my life. But the situation in your life may be different. It's okay. Just see how God can help you apply this to your life, to your context, whatever stage of life you're in. Prophet, priest, and king. So be that. And as you grow in life, that means Lord, so you go from being single to being married to having a family, etc., etc. Keep this in mind. Your prophet, priest, and king. See how you can be that in that season, in each season of life. And in every area. Home, wife, children, workplace, other things. We didn't talk much about the workplace, but same thing applies. Prophet, priest, king. You play that role. Even in the workplace. Same thing. Amen.